an ambitious project that was started and halted several times, an exciting product whose market launch caused a real commercial war, and a very promising model that was created by one company and transferred to another. At first sight, it may seem that an airplane with such an intricate and dramatic story just can be successful, but it is proving the opposite. Hello aviators, Sky here, and today we will meet one of the most advanced airliners in the world. It's gonna be interesting. The Airbus A220, formerly known as C-Series, is a family of narrow-body jet airliners. A family created by the Canadian Bombardier Consortium became part of the bigger Airbus family and is being produced in Canada and the US. Let's find out how did this happen. The story of this seemingly brand new airliner began back in the previous century. It was the 1990s, a time of frantic growth of regional transportation, and one of the driving forces of the time were the creations of the Bombardier Consortium, the CRJ series airliners. The success of this model, as well as ambition, kept the manufacturer on its toes. Bombardier wanted to have a larger and more efficient airliner. This led to the start of the Bombardier Regional Jet Expansion Project, also known as BRJX in 1998. It was one fine project, the configuration of a mainline airliner, a capacity of 85 to 100 passengers and more than a decent range. But financial resources just could not keep up with the ambitions, and the project had to be seized in favor of development of the CRJ program. This situation lingered up until the mid-2000s, when delaying it was no longer possible. The A318 and Boeing 737-600 were evolving quite well, while the Embraer E-Jet was conquering the market at a breathtaking pace. The guys from Bombardier realized that they would either create the new airliner or end up sidelined in a decade. The old project was picked up from the shelf and was named C-Series. They kept the original configuration, but increased the capacity to 110-135 passengers, with a range of over 6,000 kilometers, 3,200 miles. The ambitions did not go anywhere. The future airliner had to become the most efficient in its class, which would allow it to compete with Embraer and easily replace the old guys in airline fleets. There was a whole bunch of old Douglases, Avros, Fokkers, and even old Boeing planes. A great prospective market. In addition to that, such performance would allow the C-Series to step on the toes of Boeing and Airbus. The potential market was measured in thousands of airplanes, and the Canadians wanted to have a chunky piece of this pie. But once again, the risks were considered big. The project was getting more and more expensive, and when its cost topped $2 billion, it was frozen once more. There was only a limited amount of work carried out while Bombardier was in search of investors. This, by the way, made things easier. Their new partners promised to assume part of the costs, and the project received the support of the Canadian and British governments. The Brits were heartened by the prospect of taking a big part of the future manufacturing to their land. Finally, Bombardier has officially announced the C-Series program at the Farnborough Air Show in 2008. The company envisioned the C-Series as a family consisting of two basic airliners, the CS-100 and CS-300, as well as their extended range modifications. Their capacity had grown again, up to 135 passengers on the CS-100 and up to 160 on the CS-300. As it happens, there were plans to create an even bigger version with a capacity of 180 packs, the CS-500. But those plans had to be put on hold, at least until the initial stages of the project. Its cost kept growing and there were no resources to spare. On September 16, 2013, a CS-100 prototype made its maiden flight from the Mirabel Airport in Montreal, the home of Bombardier. Flight tests did not go perfectly smooth, and one of the main problems was the engine failure on the prototype, which made it necessary to reschedule the program. By the time the CS-300 prototype took off on February 27, 2015, Bombardier managed to more or less get back on track with the schedule. By the end of the main certification program in 2016, Bombardier had already racked up orders for 250 units. The CS-100 airliner, delivered to Swiss International Airlines, made its first commercial flight from Zurich to Paris in July 2016. 
and the operation of the larger CS300 started in December of the same year by Air Baltic, with its inaugural flight from Riga to Amsterdam. The planes did splendidly. They were technologically advanced, economic, very comfortable and easy to maintain. These are great results, especially if you take into consideration the fact that the C-Series was brand new and still had its box. Most of these problems were related to avionics and, of course, the engines, which were full of surprises, not always pleasant ones. However, the success within the fleets of launch customers did not mean success for the manufacturer. The program's spending had long gone over $5 billion, which even with side support was an excessive burden for Bombardier. Besides, the plunge in oil prices made it more cost-efficient to use larger airliners, which in turn shrunk the demand for smaller regional jets. All this was topped with the problems experienced during flight tests, scheduled delays and slow deliveries. An epic market conquest was not meant to happen. The Canadians had in mind a bold solution to their problems. They planned to make a glamorous appearance on one of the main regional jet markets, which is right by their side, in the United States. It was supposed to be achieved with an epic deal with Delta Airlines, which would acquire 75 planes with an option for another 50. This company had a huge fleet of obsolete Boeings and Douglases, and the CS100 was a great option. However, it turned out that this contract included a huge discount, which did not go unnoticed by the guys from Seattle. It's not like Boeing had never done something like that, but this time around it was depicted as an aggressive expansion of a foreign company. That is a great excuse to resort to the US government, which obviously had to protect their own. This little commercial war ended with implementation of the import taxes so high that they had basically slammed the door to the US market right in the face of the C-Series. This brought about a lot of scandals and debates among both aviators and politicians. It seemed that the story of the C-Series ended before even beginning. However, some friends from the old continent came to the rescue. In 2017, Airbus and Bombardier created a joint company, C-Series Aircraft Limited Partnership. The Europeans had the majority stake, which basically meant that the C-Series program passed into the hands of Airbus. The good news though is that it did get a chance to resurrect. The Welcome to Airbus. Welcome to the Airbus family. Bienvenidos a la familia. Welcome to the family, welcome to Airbus. Indeed, becoming a part of such a titan as Airbus had solved most of the critical problems. The immense manufacturing capabilities, a worldwide delivery and maintenance network, as well as financial and marketing tools gave the project a significant boost. What's more, Airbus could get the airplane back into the US market. The thing is that the American authorities have imposed duties specifically on import. So, the solution was to simply manufacture the airplanes for local clients at the Airbus plant in the city of Mobile, Alabama. Now it would be a local production. At the same time, the main manufacturing platform is still found in the city of Mirabel in Canada. Interesting fact, it is the first Airbus model that is not produced in Europe. Obviously, a question soon arose. As now it is an Airbus, the plane had to have a corresponding name and C-Series was not the one. There were lots of debates on this topic, which ended only in July 2018, when during the presentation in Toulouse was announced the birth of a family Airbus A220. Airplane Design Let's take a closer look at this sweet couple. A220-100 is the smaller capacity model, the former junior Bombardier CS100. A220-300 is the larger airplane, respectively the former Bombardier CS300. I've got to outline the big pride of the engineers. Both airplanes of the family share 95% of their parts and systems, which makes life easier for those operators who use both models. We are at Riga Airport in Latvia, the base of Air Baltic Airline. Their fleet is made up of the larger Dash 300 models, so one of them will help us get acquainted with this family. Airframe This plane has a low wing design with a slightly swept wing, two engines mounted on pylons under the wing, and a classic empennage. All in all, this is what we usually see in any modern airport. It has a wingspan of 35.1 meters, 115 feet and 1 inch, while its height reaches 11.5 meters, 37 feet and 8 inches. 
The difference in passenger capacity between the two models is provided by the differing length of the fuselages. The A220-100 is 35 meters long, 114 feet and 9 inches, while the A220-300 is 38.7 meters long, 126 feet. It is worth mentioning that with their extensive experience and a great pool of partners, the guys from Bombardier aimed right from the beginning to create a very technologically advanced aircraft, which of course also meant advanced materials. Around 46% of the airframe is made of composites. The center wing box, aft section of the fuselage, engine nacelles, empennage and the wing, the great pride of the Belfast plant, and the reason why the UK is rooting for this plane so much. The wingtips are also made of composite materials. It is one of the genetic traits of Bombardier, and you will find those same tips on their large business jets. Next up are the new aluminum lithium alloys, which make up 24% of the airframe, almost the entire fuselage. The last, but not least important, is titanium, which makes up 8%. It is mostly used for the tail fairing and the engine pylons. All those tech solutions made the aircraft very aerodynamically efficient, and it also dropped some weight, which improved economic efficiency and allowed it to take more cargo on board. The maximum takeoff weight of the smaller A220-100 reaches 63.1 tons, while the larger A220-300 can take off weighing as much as 69.9 tons. High Lift Devices in terms of wing mechanization, the A220 is quite a classic modern airliner. Each wing console has two large single-slotted flaps, an air brake, four section spoilers, ailerons, and of course on the front edge it features slats. That is a complete package and it gives the airplane a decent takeoff and landing performance. A fully loaded Dash 300 needs just 1,890 meters or 6,200 feet to take off, and as little as 1,500 meters or 4,900 feet to land, although it can do pretty well with even shorter runways. Landing Gear This airliner stands on a tricycle landing gear with a rotating front leg and two wheeled bogies on each of the main supports. The gears are surprisingly minimalistic. Two solutions were implemented in order to simplify them, reduce their dimensions and weight. The first one was to not use the central landing gear doors. This means that when retracted, the landing gear is not completely hidden, which spoils the aerodynamics a little, but at the same time allows to get rid of some surfaces and mechanisms. The second solution was to use more electric systems than usual. These are used in a number of devices of the legs and in the brakes as well. Yeah, what you see here are not hydraulic hoses, but electric cables. This means smaller dimensions and greater reliability. The landing gear well in the central wing box is covered by a composite fairing. Looks gorgeous. Fuel System Although the fuel system has mostly classic configuration, it still has some interesting features. The aircraft has three main fuel tanks. Two of them are found in the wing consoles, and one large tank occupies the space inside the central wing box and in the wing reaching the pylons. This gives quite a decent fuel capacity. The A220-100 can carry 21,800 liters of fuel, 5,700 gallons, while the A220-300 can take in a bit less, 21,500 liters, or 5,600 gallons, which is about 17.5 tons. Most of this fuel is stored in the central tank. All this gives these airliners quite good flight ranges. The 100s model can fly as far as 6300 kilometers, while the Dash 300 can reach up to 6200 kilometers. Cargo compartment. There are two cargo compartments in the lower part of the fuselage, which are separated by the central wing box. Since the two versions of the airplane differ in fuselage lengths, the volume of their cargo compartments is also different. In the case of the A220-100, it is 23.7 cubic meters, while in the case of the A220-300, it is 31.6 cubic meters. Each cargo compartment has its own door on the right side of the fuselage. It is, of course, electrically driven. Passenger Cabin The fuselage has a round cross-section with a 3.5 meters diameter, which gets down to 3.28 meters or 10 feet and 9 inches inside the cabin. 
In this regard, the A220 is somewhere in the middle. It is larger than any modern regional jet, but is still narrower than mid-range airliners. Thanks to the additional space, soundproofing and new finishing, the plane boasts quite a high comfort level. In fact, the only thing that sets it apart from the new mid-range airliners is the number of seats in a row. In its basic configuration, it has a 3 plus 2 scheme, and in the Comfort Plus versions, 2 plus 2. That is quite a usual configuration for its class. The same thing can be seen on such planes as the SSJ-100 or Boeing 717. However, having a bit more space makes it possible to have a bit wider aisle, bigger seats and huge overhead compartments. There is one interesting but barely visible quirk. In the rows with three seats, the middle one is one inch wider than the others. All the seats are 18 inches, while here it is 19 inches. But I guess it's time for me to stop blabbing and let those who actually work here to tell their story. Because they definitely know better than I do how everything works here. Airbus is relatively very new aircraft. Uh, we have it in our company in our Baltic for around almost three years. And uh, this aircraft is uh, the most um, economical and greenest aircraft that, it, that there is now in the world. We are as well striving forward to reduce CO2 emissions, which is our goal and everyone should strive for it. But I really like working on this aircraft because it is very comfortable for cabin crew and as well for passengers. As for cabin crew, we have a lot of space for bags, where to put passenger bags. We have different options where to stow stuff as well for catering, business class, economy class, uh, for all of that stuff. We have many different uh, lockers where to put something. Another important thing about the dimensions. A nice bonus of the new design and materials used to build the fuselage are huge windows. 28 by 41 centimeters or 11 by 16 inches. And these are more than just figures from a pamphlet. They are really noticeably bigger than in any plane of this class, inferior only to wide body airliners. It is a considerable improvement of comfort level. Bigger windows means more natural light inside the cabin, better visibility, and personally for me, of course, it makes filming so much easier. The creators of this plane spared no expense with additional comfort features as well. For cabin crew, it's very comfortable to work on this plane because we have amazing so-called CMS, our little screen, where we can see the whole cabin. For instance, working on an old plane, older planes like Boeing 737, you can't um, put higher or lower the cabin temperature. You constantly need to go to the pilots or call them and to tell, please, increase the temperature, decrease the temperature, but here is an amazing option where we can uh, uh, control it ourselves. As well, we can see passenger calls, we can uh, put music during the boarding and the vacation, which is a very nice feature for the passengers, that they can come in together with a nice uh, music and then they can leave the aircraft as well with a nice and calming music. We can put uh, different types of videos on uh, passenger screens, which is as well a new option in our company, because on Dash Q400 and in Boeing 737 we don't have this option. And passengers always say that they like this plane because it's very bright. Usually on older planes the seats are black, dark blue, but on this plane it's like this kind of color, it's like gray but sort of white, and it makes the plane bright and it looks like more spacious in the cabin because of this and this is what passengers notice that it's very bright modern and new aircraft just like most planes of this class the a220 has two kitchens and two toilets in the aft and nose sections the kitchens feature all modern appliances as well as places to store and heat up what we later find on our tray tables of course we can also find here the instruments used by the cabin crew the aft kitchen is meant to serve the economy class passengers, hence it is larger. The front kitchen is primarily meant to serve the scarce business class, hence it features the same kind of equipment, but scaled down. There is not much to be told about the lavatories. They are very spacious and are realized in a minimalistic scale with quality materials. Nothing special, but at the same time no corners cut. Naturally, these two airplanes have a different passenger capacity. 
The smaller A220-100 is designed to accommodate 100 to 120 passengers in a standard two-class configuration, with a maximum capacity of 135. The larger A220-300 has room for 120-150 passengers in a two-class configuration, with a maximum capacity of 160 seats. I'd like to say that cabins will vary from operator to operator. This means different seat configurations, cabin options, multimedia, and of course corporate styles of the companies. Let's take for example the Swiss Airlines A220-100, which can take on board 125 passengers, while the same plane from Delta Airlines fleet has only 109 seats, as it also has a business class with 4 seats in a row. At the same time, the Korean Air A220-300 can take in 140 people, while the same model at Air Baltic features 145 seats, and even with this capacity, you'll find here a cabin separator, wardrobes and other features. You can get into this airplane through 7 doors. Two at the front part of the cabin, another two in the aft section, plus two additional small emergency exits over the wing. The seventh door is found on the ceiling of the cockpit. The thing is that the new cockpit glazing gives an excellent view from the inside, and it looks even better from the outside, but its windows cannot be opened. Yeah, now it's harder to yell at the ground crews and you can't take a selfie. But safety rules cannot be ignored, pilots must have an alternative exit from the cockpit. Precisely this is the reason why this emergency hatch was installed here. Cockpit. And so, the cockpit. At first, it seems to be quite the usual thing. It has the same configuration and colors as many other commercial airliners. But the ambitions and experience Bombardier has in building large business jets did their thing, and by today's standards, this cockpit is as advanced as it gets. The avionics are based on the Proline Fusion Core by Rockwell Collins. The interface is made up of five completely functional and customizable 15-inch displays. The pilots have the freedom to decide what is more important for them to see on the screens. Meanwhile, all the interfaces are redundant and interchangeable. The pilots will have access to the most important information, even if some unbelievable mishap will leave them with only one working screen. Just like in most high-end systems, ProLine's cursors can be moved with an interface on the control panel. It can be used with one hand, which allows to always have the second hand on the side stick. Yes, the A220 uses side sticks. They are classic and look quite simple. Inside, they have vibration motors, which are activated in extreme cases, like when the plane is about to stall. Obviously, everything is controlled via fly-by-wire. Hence the force exerted by the pilot is converted into an electric signal of the computer and after that transmitted to the system that they actually intend to manipulate. The level of automation here is extremely high. By default, all the tumblers are set at auto and most of the work is done by the plane itself. Yet another excuse to argue if the plane is being handled not by pilots but rather by operators. The fact that part of the instruments have been moved into the digital dimension of the computers explains the uncanny feeling of emptiness inside the cockpit. For example, one of the most widespread elements here used to be the circuit breakers. They were scattered all over the walls. Now, most of them are virtual, and only the most critical ones remain in physical form. Just take a look at the cockpit of a Boeing 737-300 with the entire set of physical controls. Compared to it in terms of space, the A220 cockpit is a dance hall. A hall that has some special, unusual sound, reminding some kind of spaceship. Obviously, all these solutions make it possible to simplify the piloting process and increase the comfort level for the crew. After all, not everything revolves around the passengers. The cockpit is designed for two pilots and has a foldable chair for the third, let's say, authorized person. The seats are electronically adjustable with the possibility to change their height, and they will be a good fit even for the tallest and the shortest pilots. The pedals can be adjusted as well. There are also foldable tray tables, which are hidden by the side of the knee, and they are easy to pull and unfold. The engines. 
One of the main advantages of this new aircraft is its burning heart. The power plant consists of two cutting-edge PW1500G turbofan engines developed by Pratt Whitney. In fact, it is an entire family of aircraft engines with a thrust that ranges between 85 and 147 kN, and a lot of different jets are being lifted under the sky by these engines. Apart from the A220, they can be seen under the wing of the A320neo, Embraer E-Jet E2, the Japanese Mitsubishi Space Jet, formerly known as MRJ, and the Russian MC-21. One of the main innovations and sources of pride for Pratt Whitney is the gearbox between the fan and the compressors. It's worth mentioning that a gearbox inside a jet engine is nothing revolutionary in itself. Such mechanisms were used before, but those were small engines meant for regional and business jets. Now, Pratt Whitney has taken this concept to an entirely new level. So, what's so special about it? Normally, the fans and compressors rotate at the same speed in these engines. The problem is that this is a compromise speed. It is too high for the fans and too low for the compressors. However, the gearbox allows to maintain two different speeds, which are optimal for both engine elements. What does that give us? The airflow through the second spool is more optimal, while the pressure in the compressors is conversely higher, which improves overall performance. By lowering the rotation speeds of the fan, the aviators got rid of a problematic situation where the tips of the blades were reaching the sound barrier, which means that now there is a considerable noise reduction. Besides, now the blades can be bigger, their number got reduced to just 20 and the diameter of the fan has grown. This in turn made it possible to reach the bypass ratio of 12 to 1, which is completely astounding. All these solutions, along with a series of other improvements, gave in return an excellent performance. Fuel consumption per seat was reduced by 20%, greenhouse gas emissions fell by 20-50%, to 50 and the noise was reduced by a whopping 75%. Yeah, the difference between the real performance and promotional info is quite ambiguous, but one thing is certain. These engines can easily be considered as some of the most advanced in the world at this moment. However, such technological advances came at a price. These cutting-edge engines made it into the industry not without some adventures. Thrust loss, vibrations, failures, mechanical damage and other unpleasant events have affected both the A220 and the A320neo families, giving a lot of work to Pratt Whitney, Airbus and the airlines using these planes. In fact, aviation authorities have even imposed limitations on the operations of these planes and demanded additional testing. But I have to give the new engines some credit. In spite of having lots of issues, they didn't cause any really dangerous incidents. Besides, they were tweaked quite a bit and this has had an effect. These engines are now showing quite a stable performance. Fun fact. Two modifications of the A220 can be equipped with four optional engines. Two of them, the 1521G and the 1524G with 93.4 and 103.6 kN of thrust respectively, can be considered as the basic ones, which are installed at the discretion of the client on both the 100 and the 300 models. However, in order to take the potential of these planes one step further, these engines also feature one derated version, the 1519G with 84.1 kN of thrust, and on the contrary, the forced 1525G capable of reaching 109 kN of thrust thanks to some software adjustments. The weakest engine can be fitted only on the A220-100 to improve its efficiency, while the most powerful can come only with the A220-300 model to improve its performance in hot and highland operations. All of these engines are optimized for cruise flights at 447 to 470 knots, about 829 to 871 kilometers per hour, which is an average speed for the airliners of this size. Each engine is fitted with thrust reversers, something quite usual for modern civilian aviation. However, after taking a closer look at it, we realize how simple and light it is. During maintenance, all of the cowls and surfaces, including the thrust reverse devices, are easily lifted, granting full access to all the engine systems. The power plant has yet another small burning heart. In the aft section, we have an auxiliary power unit, 
The 331 series Honeywell is quite a popular device that found its place in several Boeing and Airbus airliners as well as in regional CRJ and mid-range COMAX C919 and MC21. Well, now we know what we're dealing with, but how is this beauty doing these days? In addition to the fact that this aircraft had excellent specifications right from the start, it kept evolving. Operational experience of both models by Air Baltic and Swiss has shown that this airplane's performance exceeded the expectations. The A220-300 is more efficient economically than the old Boeing 737-300 in the Latvian fleet by more than 20%, while the operational costs of the Swiss A220-100 are 25% lower than those of the Avro RJ. The aircraft has also shown excellent takeoff and landing performance. The Swiss fly their A220-100s to London City Airport, one of the most demanding airports for the inbound aircraft. This gave justice to the expectations set at the beginning of the project. This airliner can compete with the most advanced machines, the lower tier modifications of the A320neo, Boeing 737 MAX and the Embraer E-Jet E2. And the older generations it came to replace can barely have any comparison to this cutting edge machine. The launch operators have already retired their Jumbolinos and the 737-300s. With the arrival of Airbus, this aircraft started to live up to its full potential. The resources of the corporation made it possible to establish a complete support cycle, from marketing and sales financing to personnel training and maintenance. All of this was done in addition to the development of the airplane itself. In 2018, its certification was extended to allow Category 3A and 3B instrumental landings with poor visibility, and the ETOPS limitations for twin jets were extended from 120 to 180 minutes. What's more important is that these planes started to actively expand their presence on the international market. Korean Air became the third operator, and there are more coming up. Since 2019, the planes that were manufactured in the US were delivered to Delta Airlines and not long ago, they also reached their motherland as part of the Air Canada fleet. As of 2020, the A220 family has a total of 495 orders by 24 clients. Over 100 planes have been delivered to their buyers and are being operated, while production rate is growing. When it all started in 2016, only 7 units were delivered, in 2017, 17. Then in 2018, they already built 33 planes, and in 2019, this number grew to 48 units. Airbus has some quite extensive ambitions for this project. Over the next 20 years, they are aiming at half of the market for airliners with a capacity of 100 to 150 packs, which is roughly 3,000 planes. If the manufacturing process will be optimized in accordance to the possibilities of the European Consortium, the production cost can decrease while the production rate can grow up, according to some estimates, to 100 units per year. In 2019, Airbus even claimed that with the innate potential of these airliners, they could increase the takeoff weights, fuel capacity and flight ranges, with 6.5 to 7,000 kilometers being completely feasible figures. Besides, the good old ideas Bombardier had about extending the fuselage and increasing the passenger capacity are coming back to life. And this could mean that the possible A220-500 could bite off a part of the market occupied by the basic A320s and might move the entire family upwards in terms of passenger capacity. If we take into consideration all the efforts Airbus puts into the development of the A321 and the competition in the middle of the market, this plan seems to have its logic. The Europeans have the opportunity to create a very dense presence in the market segment ranging from the A220-100 up to the A321, which is all the way between 100 and 240 seats. Of course, you know, this crazy corona apocalypse has brought along some changes to the plans, and 2020 has become an extremely gloomy year for world aviation, and this includes the A220 as well. But let's hope that the decrease in flights, demand and production of new airplanes won't last for too long, and everything will get back to normal rather soon. It is startling to see how amazing this plane is and how intricate is its story. It was wildly criticized and buried alive, and yet here it is, blooming in all of its glory. 
Airbus A220 is one of the most modern and advanced airliners in the world. And with the capabilities of the European Corporation, in the 21st century this plane can become an outstanding and quite popular specimen in the breed of passenger jet birds. Unfortunately, it is time for us to leave the airport of Riga, the nest of Air Baltic and their fleet. I am especially grateful to this airline for the opportunity to get acquainted with their birds, and to their personnel, none of this would be possible without their help. And of course, thank you to Bombardier for creating this beauty, and to Airbus for preserving it for us. And you, my dear aviation fans, fly with comfort on stylish airplanes, like and subscribe to the channel. Fast flights and soft landings to you.